everyone. Uh, welcome to our second seminar in this uh, Bloomberg American Health Initiative uh, Evidence Workgroup Data Resources Seminar Series. I'm Liz Stewart. I uh, lead the Evidence Workgroup for the Bloomberg American Health Initiative and I'm uh, really excited to have this set of four talks this fall where we're trying to expose um, students and faculty and staff and external people, whoever wants to, to some data resources on topics related to the initiative. So I just want to quickly advertise those. Uh, we already had one that was on education data in Baltimore, uh, so hopefully some of you were at that. And then we have two more after today. One is uh, next Tuesday, Amanda Lattimore is, uh, will be same time, same place, uh, 1215 to 120 on data for studying the opioid epidemic. And then um, on Thursday, November 15th, Nilanjan Chatterjee from Biostatistics uh, we'll talk about leveraging mega cohorts like the UK Biobank and some of the data sets available and things like the ECHO initiative um, to study public health. Uh, I want to, uh, this is being live streamed just so you all know and hopefully we have some people listening and watching online. I also want to thank Cola Francis and Maya Johnstone for helping set and do a lot of the, set up and do a lot of the logistics. So moving to today's uh, topic, uh, today we're very happy to have Annie Corrigan and Anton Kavit here to talk about spatial data resources for Baltimore City. Both of them are research data analysts at the Johns Hopkins Spatial, Spatial Science for Public Health Center. Sorry, I was trying to put center in the wrong place. Um, Annie received her Master's of Science in Environmental Sciences and Engineering from UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health. She was an ORISE Fellow at um, the EPA and helped launch Smoke Sense, a citizen science initiative to exchange and understand information about exposure and response to wildfire smoke. Um, currently, she's interested in applying GIS and spatial analysis to a wide variety of environmental and public health issues to serve the community, some of which we'll hear about today. Anton Kvit received his Master's of Science in Epidemiology from um, our school. His previous and current work includes a variety of things, looking at the association of weather and environmental factors with malaria incidents in Zambia, analyzing healthy food availability in Baltimore, uh, together with the Center for a Livable Future, uh, and other projects around infectious and chronic disease and community health in the US. Uh, he also has interests in epidemiological, GIS, and spatial methods, interactive data visualization, and M health. So I know I'm looking forward to learning a lot from both of them, and I will turn it over, I guess, to Annie first. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, everyone. So Thank you for the introduction, Liz. Um, as she mentioned today, we're, we'll be presenting on spatial data resources in Baltimore City. Um, in our talk today, we hope to accomplish four things. First, we'll provide you with a brief introduction to spatial data. Um, we'll then make it a pretty demonstrative uh, presentation. So we're gonna identify some open access platforms for spatial data and data at large um, about Baltimore specifically, and then some more on Maryland and nationwide. We'll navigate kind of those platforms, and the ones we'll be navigating today are all open access, so they're free, publicly available. Um, and then we'll demonstrate the data acquisition process, and we'll go through the various subject matters and what it looks like at these different platforms. And then finally, we'll show you some real world applications of the work that we have done and that can be done with these resources. So first of all, what is spatial data? Spatial data is any data that includes geographic location or addresses. So we like to think of three types of data, but of course it's any data with this location that basically think about what can you map. Um, at the example in the top right, you can see there are points where we have Lyme disease cases and controls, and the data itself is the location. So there isn't necessarily a value besides a case or control at that point. We call this point pattern data. And then we also have points in this NO2 air monitors location, which we know as geostatistical data. So those point locations actually have a measurement of an observed value, so a concentration at a given location. And then finally, we also talk about area level data. Um, this example is the number of um, sexually transmitted infections per census tract, which is an area level um, in Baltimore City. So we also might be familiar with other socio-demographic information, which we see like medium income at the county level. 
and that is all under area data. Next, why do we care about spatial data? So it's very simple to say that everyone loves maps. Um, it's nice to look at something and know where it is in space, to take a research question and be able to visualize that information. Maps can be particularly persuasive because that data comes in colors or in patterns, and we can see that. Um, further, we take that into spatial statistics also. So the first rule of geography is that everything is related, but things that are more near, we'd expect to be more, more related. Um, and we have ways, um, tools of spatial statistics that we can use to analyze that data. So together, we have the spatial data, which is the information with locations. Then we have geographic information systems, the GIS, which is how we put that into a map, the software we use to manipulate that data and to visualize that data. Um, and then spatial statistics. And together at Hopkins, we have um, defined spatial data, GIS, and spatial statistics as our spatial science paradigm. And this is what we use to direct the applications research that we do, as well as the education in spatial data. So going from that kind of conceptual framework, we start to look at kind of the more specific details of what it looks like. And that's when we deal with file formats of the spatial data. So today, we're in our demonstration, we'll show you a few different ways you can download and the file formats of that data. Often it'll come as tabular data, which I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. Um, that would be an Excel sheet or a CSV where we've got li long list of observations. And oftentimes we'll have one column that is the geographic identifier for that information. So we have long coordinates or we have addresses. And that column can then be attached to spatial data for mapping. Data can also be geocoded, which is the process of taking an address and attaching it to a map and assigning it that coordinate. Next, we also deal with vector data, where the data and the information is already attached to the spatial information. And these images you see on the slide are the three main types of vector data that we deal with. <clears throat> Um, that can be polygons, lines, or, or points. So the polygons at the top right will have that area level data. Um, we also look at lines in Baltimore City, which could be streets. And finally, points. And those points could be locations, which is the point pattern data, or it could be points with information associated with it. Next, we also might deal with raster data. We'll show you an example of what that looks like today. And that is a continuous data at the pixel level. So for every pixel, whether it's very small or larger, we have a value. And oftentimes, we deal with this from satellite imagery. Or we can also process our own raster data, whether it is a vegetative index that we have processed from satellite imagery, or whether we're making a predictive surface so that we can show an image of data we have manipulated ourselves. And we'll go through each of these as we download files in our presentation today. Now, um, getting into Baltimore data more specifically, in Baltimore, these are the types of area level data that we generally deal with. Uh, the census defines a nice structure to area level data for us. So Baltimore City is its own county, which you'll see outlined in blue here. Uh, within Baltimore, uh, Baltimore City, there are 55 community statistical areas. Those fit nicely without any overlapping or needing to cut them. They nest perfectly. And then within those, we, we have census tracts. In Baltimore City, there are 200 census tracts. And within the census tracts, in gray, you see block groups. And there are 650 of those in Baltimore. Finally, which isn't illustrated here, are blocks, which is our finest level of area level data available from the census. Um, that is often harder to work with in public health because 
it's such a fine resolution that it's often privacy protected for um, data protection reasons. Um, also in Baltimore, though, it's not entirely census data. We also look at um, the area level with neighborhoods. Baltimore has a lot of unique neighborhoods. Um, and we also might be familiar with zip code level data. So in our demonstration today, we'll run through um, five major sources of data, the three of which will be Baltimore specific. Open Baltimore, the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance, and Baltimore City View kind of take on different platforms, um, but they all provide Baltimore specific data and they are all free, publicly available. Some of these uh, are different because they might be open access, but that's not the same as open source. Open source is where the community members or anyone would be able to upload onto that platform, and we'll go ahead and specify which ones that is the case for. We'll also look at Maryland data in general, which uh, is on Maryland IMAP, a Maryland food systems map, and then we'll provide you with a list of other resources. So moving towards the demonstration, um, we'll go through those five, well, those five platforms I mentioned, um, and then we'll actually download the files and show you how we would go about manipulating and analyzing that data and ma making presentation level maps. We'll do this through ArcGIS software um, which is a geographic information system. It does take subscribership, so Hopkins has a subscription and license to this software. Um, but you'll get an idea today in the presentation of what that looks like and how this spatial data can come together. So I'm going to take you into the internet. Um, so this is Open Baltimore. It is hosted by the city of Baltimore and run by the chief data officer for the city. This is a pretty common interface for open data platforms where uh, they like to organize things by topic, make it pretty visual and let you hone in on what you might be interested in. So we see that there is city government, finance, culture and arts. Um, we can click straight into one of these categories. So first, we'll go ahead and take a look at health. Um, and this is an example of Open Baltimore um, is open source as well. So you can see underneath these filters on the left side, which sources are official, which will be, won't have an indicator, or the community has put them on. So you can see it's any member of the community might have collected their own data, worked for an, their own organization, and then made it available on Open Baltimore and they go ahead and label those as such. That's just something to keep in mind as you think about quality assurance of data and where you get your data from, because this is a platform for hosting a lot of data, uh, but it'll go ahead and tell us the source of where, who actually collected that. So for example, we can click into homeless shelters, and Open Baltimore gives us a nice idea before we download it of what that data might look like. It'll, so about this data set in particular, we can see how big it is. So we know the rows and columns. This is relatively small with 40 rows, seven columns. And then we can actually look into what it contains. So, and a preview of that data. So we have the names of homeless shelters. We have zip codes, neighborhoods, um, districts identified. And then this would become spatial data once we attach this location in geocoding I mentioned earlier, we would need to take this and attach it in, through the process of geocoding. Now, instead of downloading this, let's go ahead and check out what some other data looks like. Um, we might be interested in transportation data. I'm going to hope this keeps loading. Let me see. OK. Um, and on Open Baltimore, as with a lot of platforms, you can go ahead and filter on this left side. So let's filter. We're already in transportation, and we're interested in maybe the, just the official data. You can see we 
might want to look at where red light cameras are. And today, for the purpose of this presentation, we're going to download Charm City Circulator uh, oh, ridership. We can get ridership and attach that as well. But today, we're going to look at the roots. So roots will be an example of a line file. So in this map, you can see these are just lines of where these roots are. This map allows us to kind of get an idea of what the data looks like before we actually go ahead and use it. But if we are to do our own analysis and say, this is the data we want, we're going to need to export it so that we can manipulate it ourselves. Um, these are the geospatial data types. KML and KMZ are Google Earth files. Um, and most commonly, we like to use a shape file. So we're going to download the shape file. And a shape file is actually a series of related files. So it has that attribute information as well as the spatial informa reference information all attached to it. So that's why it downloads as a zip file. Before we leave Open Baltimore, um, we're going to also download census tracts, which we can get specific to the city. Um, census tracts will give us population information. Um, and since we know what we already want, we can go ahead and search for those specifically. Um, the Open Baltimore lists the data type on the right. So we could look at the map like we did with the ridership, the routes for the Charm City Circulator, or we know what we want, so we can go straight into this shape document. Um, again, it'll download as a zip file, so it doesn't have that information about the data set already um, presented, but we'll be able to extract this data um, from our downloads later. OK. So that's an idea of what Open Baltimore looks like. Open Baltimore is one of the largest um, aggregators of data across the city. And it obviously has a wide variety of subjects and allows for community members to contribute as well. But um, the next one we want to show is the Baltimore Neighborhoods Indicators Alliance. Um, this is a project out of the University of Baltimore. And they have put more emphasis on uh, this vital signs reporting. So Baltimore BNIA makes an effort to take the pulse, is how they define it, uh, of the well-being of communities in Baltimore. So it defines these uh, communities as the 55 community statistical areas, those CSAs that I mentioned earlier. So you can see that on their homepage in this map. And again, with this interactive interface, we could click into one of these neighborhoods and get an idea of what neighborhoods are actually within this CSA and the population. So what's helpful here is that they give us an idea of one of these places before we're committing to what we want to download ourselves. And it also is helpful to compare between places automatically just to do some exploration of what they have. Um, it's helpful to compare between neighborhoods and within neighborhoods. So, or we could look at this data by topic area, which is how we had looked through it before. They have demographics, health, crime, and safety, some similar categorization of that information. Or we can look at what they consider these indicators. So they have 150 plus indicators that they consider the vital signs. And we can scroll through some of these as well to give you an idea of how specific some of these variables are. And also the uh, sources and time for which that data is available. So um, it'll go ahead and give us a definition. We can see some are going to be economic, some are more uh, demographic. We'll have some crime data. And all throughout this, they have been listing the sources and seeing when it might be available. If we're to click through any one of these, I'm going to go down to some what I think is interesting information from the libraries. So this is an example of a more specific data set. 
um, that BNI, working with stakeholders in the community, has identified as important uh, for the well-being of communities. And they have some really easy to use tools on their website directly. So we can have the table of just these counts. And this is persons with library card per 1,000 residents. And it makes it easy for us to actually get an idea of what that data looks like. We could also click into indicator trends here. And then we could be specific with what um, this particular variable looks like in diff the different neighborhoods that they've identified. So this is just a pretty cool tool to get you um, thinking about what, you, what questions you might have to ask, and then making it pretty easy if you want to take a preliminary image of what that looks like. They also pre-make some maps. A lot of these resources will have pre-made maps for you to have an idea or just to make your pitch about what questions you have to ask. But then as we said before, um, in order to run your own analysis, we want to get the data ourselves. All the data directly through BNIA is going to be um, table tables. What the charts we we're just looking at will come as tables. But if we want to get shape files, which we had started to get before, we need to actually launch their platform. And this is run by, uh, hosted by ESRI, e -S -R -I, which is also the um, group that makes ArcGIS. And they make it easy to kind of do that same visualization online. Um, again, this is just another place where you can get an idea of the summaries of each of these communities. And if you know what you want exactly, you could click into any one of these variables and see what it looks like distributed between the 55 CSAs. But for the purposes of this, we'll want to download the entire um, data set. And we're going to, again, get another shape file. There you go. So that is the Baltimore Neighborhoods Indicators Alliance. And Anton is going to tell you about some of our other sources. So now we're going to switch off and talk about City View. So City View is also <coughs> run by uh, the City of Baltimore. Uh, and it's more of an interactive map tool. So if you're going to explore City View, you know you can see that it's just mostly large map uh, that you can inter interact with. And so with you know thematic overlay, you can select a broad range of variables that the City of Baltimore uh, maps out. So you know things like crime, elections, green sites, health, all sorts of variables. And so if we select education, for example, and schools, then we can get a um, map of all the schools in Baltimore City. Uh, and so, you know, as an interactive map, it has a few capabilities. So, for example, if you want to share, you know, a quick map uh, to communicate something with your colleagues, you can, you know, change how it looks like a bit, change the background of it, and then actually click printable map. <coughs> And it will create, you know, uh, just a printout of, of your map to share. Um, you know, it has some other very basic tools. So something like measurement. So if you want to measure distance between two schools, you can do that as well. Um, of course, if you want to do any kind of more complicated analysis or make more unique maps, you'll need to download this data. So one of the drawbacks of um, Baltimore City View is that you can download the data only in tabular format. So here, you know, the formats are XLS or CSV. And so if you click export data, you know, we can get the schools, but <clears throat> it's going to be just in an Excel table. So we're not going to get that shape file. Um, all right. So another tool that moving beyond just Baltimore and looking at Maryland as a whole, the Maryland IMAP. So that's run by, you know, it's a Maryland's mapping and GIS data portal. Uh, it's run by the Maryland government. And, you know, 
in many ways, it's kind of similar to Open Baltimore, but uh, for Maryland. And so, you know, here we have Maryland JS Data Catalog, which, as you see, kind of organized in a similar way as uh, Open Baltimore. So you have a broad range of data sources you can focus on: agriculture, elevation, stuff like that. Um, they have a <coughs> data visualization dashboard as well built in there, if you know for quick visualization. And then if you want more local data for specific uh, counties, you can, you know, these are all links that you can select and get the county data as well. And so, you know, for example, if we want elevation data for uh, Baltimore City, one way to do it <coughs> is measurement through a process called LIDAR. So, and so LIDAR, which is here, is uh, a technology that's similar to a radar uh, but it uses, uses a laser instead of um, radio waves. And so essentially what it does, it can create very minute <coughs> three-dimensional images of buildings and things like that, but it also can be used to measure elevation. So um, in a similar way, you know, because elevation data is gonna be in raster format, we can select rasters and... Um, so the interactive map here, you know, it shows the different areas where they have data available throughout Maryland. And so sometimes it acts a little strange. So, you know, sometimes you're going to have, you know, you're not going to see something specific for Baltimore City or for some other area. So refreshing the page helps. So if we click just Baltimore City specifically, we can get, you know, the rasters for that. And then scrolling down, you know, we have different LiDAR tools, uh, products that are available, so we can measure slope or elevation, relief. And so, for example, if we want elevation in feet, we can select that. Um, and then we, you know, this is where you would download, whoops, the elevation in feet. And so just clicking download uh, and selecting TIFF. So TIFF is a format that is most common for um, raster files that we use in ArcGIS. All right, and so finally, uh, I want to talk about the Maryland Food Systems Map. <clears throat> and so, you know, this is tool is a little bit different from a lot of the other tools we shared. Uh, it's much more specific, focusing on the you know food systems and agriculture and environment. Um, and so, you know, you're not going to have as wide range of data as available in something like Open Mo Baltimore or IMAP, but you can get some unique variables that you're not going to get elsewhere. So there are things uh, relating to agriculture and aquaculture uh, and things like that. <clears throat> of course, a lot of them focus on areas that are outside of Baltimore. But specifically, for example, for food retail, um, if we select food stores, you know, they have some data on Baltimore food stores. And so, you know, it's an attractive map like most of these other tools. And so zooming in, we can see now that, you know, we have all the food stores in Baltimore mapped out. You know, they're uh, colored also by different types. So there's supermarkets, convenience stores, public markets, et cetera. Um, you know, this tool also has some basic things as well, like a measurement tool where you can change the base map or you can also, you know, print out something if you want to quickly share this data. Uh, but if you want to download it and then analyze it, uh, then you will need to download the actual shape file of the data. So clicking on the I here, there's an option to download the data. <clears throat> it provides also, you know, some background information on what it is and the size. And then you can just download the data set uh, and download it as a shape file. All right. So we've now we've downloaded all the data that we're interested in. So now we can open ArcGIS. <clears throat> and so this is, you know, how ArcMap, the most common tool that we use in the ArcGIS system, this is how it looks like. And so we have 
all this data upload it inside so you can you know select add data and then all add all the different shape files and uh, you know CSV files and all the different files that we've downloaded and you can start combining them so for example right this is the two, 2010 census data that we got from open Baltimore so it's area level uh, you know you can see how it looks like and then if you look at the table that is associated with uh, oh, it's in the corner here. There we go. So the table that is associated with uh, this shape file, right? If you click on the different, it can be hard to see, but if you can click on the um, different rows, right? Each row is associated with a specific census tract, and so then you can have the population, uh, you know, racial distribution, age distribution, things like that for each one of those um, census tracts listed in this table. <clears throat> so on top of that, we got a similar area level data set, but now um, from the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance with the vital signs relating to education. Um, on top of that, we can add the line shape file of the bus routes and water taxi routes around the city. Um, and then also add the <coughs> points for the Baltimore city food locations that we got from the Maryland food systems map. And so, you know, you can see now that we've combined all these data sets, these, you know, different types into one map. And then we can start, you know, if we have questions, for example, about how, <coughs> you know, educational attainment and bus routes, bus availability uh, relates to healthy food access in the city. You know, you can start looking at this map and either visually or statistically starting try to analyze some of these relationships. Um, and then finally, we also, you know, have the raster of the elevation data. And so, you know, this is how the raster looks like once it's uploaded into ArcGIS. So we can also obtain data from that uh, and add it to our analysis. All right, so this was just a you know, brief overview of kind of how ArcGIS would work and how it can combine all this various data. <clears throat> all right, so briefly talking, you know, summarizing, we provided these five different sources. Um, so, you know, we wanted to kind of give a broad range of the, you know, very different sources that are out there for both Baltimore and Maryland. Um, so Open Baltimore is by far the most broad. It has, you know, a lot of different data as Annie has mentioned. One of the potential downsides is that, <clears throat> you know, this data, the community is free to add any kind of data to it. So that's also, you know, like it's a two edged sort of Sorts on one hand, uh, you can get some unique variables that you're not going to get anywhere else coming from the community, but then that data might not be very accurate or there might be issues with it. So, you know, something to certainly keep in mind if you're downloading data from open Baltimore. <laughs> Baltimore Neighborhoods Indicators Alliance, uh, it's actually very well organized. So, you know, all the data that's on there is going to be well vetted. Um, but it is only organized by uh, the <coughs> community statistical areas. So that's something that if you want data in another format, you're not gonna find it there. Baltimore City View is a great tool for a quick, you know, if you want to visually look at a map and maybe, you know, print out, communicate with someone about certain <coughs> things in the city of Baltimore, uh, but you can only download the data as tables and you know it's fairly limited on what else you can do with it other than kind of quick visualization. Uh, Maryland's IMAP is kind of similar to Open Baltimore in the sense that it has very, very broad range of data that is available. And so you know, it's a great tool. If you're focusing specifically in Baltimore, of course, sometimes you won't find the data just for Baltimore or sometimes you know, you're going to be able to download a data set only for the entire state. And so you'll have to cut it to size to Baltimore. 
And finally, the Maryland Food Systems map. So, you know, it's a little unique. Uh, <coughs> it focuses on these food system variables that you might not find elsewhere. Uh, but then, again, it doesn't necessarily have as broad of a range of the data, and it doesn't focus as much on Baltimore City because, of course, a lot of agriculture uh, and things like that are outside of the city. All right. So briefly, you know, there's a lot of other data sources out there. Uh, Department of Health, Department of Planning, both have, you know, data sources uh, and links to them. Uh, GIS and Maps at Johns Hopkins is a resource here at Hopkins that also has links. Uh, the Urban Health Institute, also associated with Johns Hopkins, has some GIS spatial and non-spatial data. And then finally, the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development. And so we provide all the links here, and we will be providing these links uh, online as well. So this is you know, something for your information. Um, and then, of course, there are the national data sources as well uh, that include you know, the whole country or even you know, beyond. But you can always subset data for Baltimore City. So the census, uh, you know, one of the first data sources that I think most people go to with the American Fact Finder, you can get you know broad, broad range of the data. Also, at very you know specifically in Baltimore, at various uh, area levels, so at census tracts or blog groups, things like that. Uh, the American Fact Finder does not provide the shape files though. So if you want the actual shape files of the data, uh, there is a Tiger Line website also related to the census that we're providing a link to where you can get shape files at all sorts of different uh, ways um, for you know anywhere in the country. Okay. So you know we've been focusing a lot on kind of health and city pro produced data. Then there's of course a lot of environmental data that you might be interested in. So the National Centers for Environmental Information, which is associated with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they have a lot of things like temperature, ozone levels, things like that. EPA, same thing. Um, so you know those are excellent sources for environmental kind of data. The CDC, of course, provides broad range of health data. And then finally, the United States Ge <coughs> Geological Survey, USGS, um, as well as NASA, provide a lot of satellite imagery. So if you want satellite imagery for Again, temperature, environmental variables, or just satellite imagery of the city, those would be the sources that you can use. All right, so a few considerations, as you know, I know we talked about a lot of different data sources. So, you know, a lot of the data we provided is going to be similar or the same, right? So some of the links are going to lead back to Open Baltimore, or they're going to lead back to census. Uh, you know, so if you're looking for a data on one link, certainly try out some other ones because they're going to be related and there's going to be you know, redundancy in the data. Um, <coughs> the interactive tools, so most of the websites that we showed have some kind of interactive mapping component. So it's very nice to you know, quickly visualize the data and see, make sure that it is what you're actually looking for. Um, but again, if you want something more compli complex or want to make your own maps, we certainly recommend downloading, downloading it and managing it using ArcGIS or some other software. Um, and so, you know, also here we downloaded all the data manually. And so, you know, if you want to create just one map or if you, you know, have one specific analysis that you want to focus on, uh, that's by far the easiest thing to do and the way to go. Uh, however, if you, for example, have a lot of large data sets over many years, like you know daily temperature data for um, 30 years, then an approach to use <coughs> would be through application programming interface or API. And so for that, you would need R, which is uh, a statistical software computing language that we use a lot. And it's you know an excellent open source tool, so it's completely free. And it has a lot of packages 
that allow it to analyze, you know, spatial data and visualize it, and in many ways work, you know, in a similar way as ArcGIS, uh, but then also provide a lot of the statistical background that ArcGIS can't do. So those are the tools I recommend. And so now uh, I want to briefly talk about some of the spatial data applications. So some of the projects that uh, we've either us or our colleagues have been involved in that have used some of this data. So first, the Baltimore City Food Environment. Uh, so this is you know developed by the Center for a Little Future by CLF, uh, and specifically they're interested in uh, mapping out the food desert in Baltimore City. And so you know there's different ways to define what a food desert is. Uh, you know the way that they defined it is kind of a area where four different variables happen. So in census tracts where the median income is under 185% of the federal poverty level, household vehicle availability is under 30%, uh, distance to supermarkets is more than a quarter of a mile, and then a healthy food availability index is under 9.5. And so you know, the first three variables is something that they can get from the census fairly easily. This data is in open access. Uh, the HFII score is something that they had to develop themselves. And so they had to go out to all the stores, you know, like the ones that uh, we had in the map from the food systems map. And they had to, you know, create their own survey and be able to rank each store based on how healthy their food availability is and create this score. And so the idea was then to combine these four scores into you know, a single map and see you know, where they overlap. So in this map here, you can see you know, areas that are the most pink or the most red uh, are the ones where more of those variables interact. So those are the areas where that are at highest risk of being in a food desert. And then the lighter the pink gets, the fewer the variables overlap there. So those areas are of less concern. Another approach, uh, another study that we're associated with is looking at instability throughout Baltimore City. And so <clears throat> there's a tool or a method Neighborhood Inventory of Environmental Typology, or NIFTY, which is a combination of 98 different factors of incivility. So it's like things like broken windows or trash on the street and things like that, that are combined together, kind of similar to HFIA score, into one total score that ranks <coughs> kind of the level of incivility throughout Baltimore City. And so, you know, these were recorded at a sample of city blocks around the city and then using the R statistical software and some spatial statistics uh, from that point level, you know, it was able, the researchers were able to create this uh, smooth map of incivility throughout the city. And then you know, their particular interest was looking at how this was uh, associated with schools. So the black squares around on this map are schools and then the White circles are the children's addresses who attend these schools. And so the idea was looking at, you know, whether children who walk to school, how they get to school, and whether they have to cross through high incivility areas. All right. And finally, another uh, project we worked on looked at <coughs> Vibrio parachymogulicus bacteria, or VP bacteria, in the Chesapeake Bay. And so, you know, this is, I know this is beyond just the city of Baltimore, but then this looked at, you know, a lot of the environmental data that we didn't necessarily look at much in the other two projects. And so, you know, VP is a bacteria found in the water of the Chesapeake Bay. It accumulates in oysters. And then if people then eat those oysters infected with the bacteria, they can get ill. And so, you know, all of interest is trying to predict where the high concentrations of this bacteria are throughout the bay, and then be able to predict this, you know, and prevent this foodborne illness. Um, and so the researchers took uh, measurements of water temperature and these other variables that are associated with 
the bacteria throughout the day. And again, using spatial statistics, we're able to create a smooth map of the risk of vibriosis of this illness throughout the Chesapeake Bay. All right, so these are the three examples that we have. Yeah, and just to wrap it up, uh, we enjoyed showing the demonstration and hope you were all able to find some new resources that you might take a look at on your own time. Um, and we also wanna provide these resources to you. Uh, we're gonna post the slides so you can have access to these links on our website, uh, which is the Spatial Science for Public Health Center website. And then also, if you want to see some more of these applications and mapping, uh, we do have GIS Day coming up. Um, that is on November 14th, and it is in this building. So you can put that on your calendars if you're interested in seeing some posters and demonstrations, or if you just want to talk or get involved in the GIS community. Uh, that we also have curriculum for spatial science that runs in courses online and here in classes. So uh, please feel free to ask us any questions about those other programs or opportunities, as well as any questions you have about what we've presented today. And this is our, also our website link. So all these slides and information and links will be provided there. Thank you very much. Uh, not a question, but a comment. Uh, so the Urban Health Institute has its request for uh, people to put in small grants, which include student applications, uh, which is due, I think, around November 8th or the middle of November. But it would fund, the, I think, the kind of projects you're talking about using the GIS data, working with one of the city agencies or some or a group in the community would be very possibly received. So I just want to, since some of you look like you might be interested in getting some, there may be some need for additional resources or convening something for you or reporting out your findings or something. So I just wanted to point out that, that and that's up on the UHI website. Great, thank you. Um, great, great information for sharing it, and so thank you for that. Um, my question is, if you know the answer, where does sort of Baltimore fit in terms of providing these types of data and the access to these data? Are we sort of leading the edge in terms of spatial data access or in the middle or what do you think? It's a good question. Sorry, I didn't mean to answer all the questions. <laughs> so, I mean, Open Baltimore, I think, is certainly a great tool and I don't think every city you know, in the U.S. has that. Certainly, most cities have a similar tool of some kind, um, though it's not necessarily as open access as Open Baltimore would be. Yeah, I would say that uh, the initiative has definitely been increasing in cities and other local governments. In this increasingly data-rich world, I think that there's a big push to make data more publicly available and more transparent of where it comes from as well. I think the trick is seeing how many sources are actually hosted on any one single platform. Uh, I think Open Baltimore has done a good job putting a lot of both the government data and departments as well as some of those unique data, data sets together. Um, but I think that that is kind of the, always the balance of quality of data and the extent of the data. And one thing I also wanted to mention, so you know, a lot of the data, even though like we showed a lot of different specific Baltimore resources, you know, for a lot of our projects, we first go to the census, right? Because the census is so broad, has you know, a very large amount of data, very, you know, very specific to specific areas, and also we know that it's well vetted and of high quality. Um, so you know, even though there are a lot of resources, a lot of the time you just go to, you know, what everybody else uses. So I would love to hear a little bit more about the application and interface. Um, so I'll let you choose which way you want to answer this question. Partly it builds on the question about Baltimore. So I'd love to hear more about, you know, of an example of working with 
like policymakers in Baltimore or city or county or something sort of just talk a little bit more about examples of how that interaction has happened or what the results have been or sort of more on a research side of sort of other examples of research questions that people have used sort of this sort of data for to help inform public health research. So I guess uh, regarding the food desert map, um, so, you know, we've been working with CLF to kind of help analyze their, uh, the data that they collected for the, um, the healthy food availability throughout the stores. And then also, you know, thinking of ways to build on the food desert map that has been created. So there are, you know, thoughts of making it a continuous sort of map rather than a discrete one. So there are uh, potentially you can find, you know, hot spots that would be lost if you just looked at these, you know, specific cutoffs that I mentioned. Um, or then, you know, there are thoughts of maybe making it interactive. So then adding, you know, if there are other variables that could be added to this food desert, or if researchers believe that they should be removed, then, you know, people at the city or researchers elsewhere would be able to do that. And so that's one of the projects that we've been working with CLF and also indirectly through, through that with the city to do that. Um, do you have any information on how often they update their um, information or how much effort is put into updating? Which resource? So, for example, like the Open Baltimore, the official data sets that they that's available. Like, how often is it done? I think uh, annually or right. I think a lot of the government data is managed by department. So it depends if you're looking at Department of Transportation versus Department of Health. But I think the goal of those departments is to update annually. Um, of course, we'd like it as close to present year as possible. Um, I think different. It depends on the department of um, kind of how quickly that gets out. I think they have slightly different deadlines and it depends on the nature of a particular data set. Um, and as for kind of community level or other resources that aren't open Baltimore or aren't government specific, uh, that just, it, I would say uh, you should expect a year or two lag on the most present data set. But they usually make that pretty readily available in like from the jump of what year or what most recent update of the data is. I would also add that federal data, so things like the census, uh, would probably be updated on a more routine schedule. And so you'd find more up-to-date information there. Yeah, also on that resource, they do allow you to contact, on Open Baltimore at least, they allow you to contact the data set owner. So there is, uh, I'm not sure, of course, how responsive and direct that is or up to date that link is, but they do have the option if you were to contact whoever created or posted the data set. In any of these resources, can you look at uh, multiple years or is it just replacing one year with the next? Certainly, I mean, you, I, it really depends kind of on the resource. And so I think some things like the uh, Neighborhoods and Indicators Alliance maybe is more set, um, but, you know, uh, things like Open Baltimore, because again, the data sets are open, right? If people add multiple year um, variables, then you can certainly get that. Uh, and then, of course, through something like the census, you can always get a wide range of data, both spatially and temporally. I guess All right, well, if there are no more questions, I guess we'll, and thank you so much. I learned a lot about um, different resources available and it's exciting. I can, hopefully many of us will then sort of move forward and have this in the back of our heads to think, oh gosh, yeah, this would be a really great compliment or a research question on its own. So thanks for a great summary. And I love this final slide <laughs> of how to learn more. Um, so let's thank them and um, hopefully see you all next week. Thank you.